Hi everyone! Flat Earthers say there's no evidence that the Earth is a spinning ball. We've covered the ball part, now let's address the spinning part. This is Fleur Pratt. Flat Earth points refuted a thousand times. To make sure you don't miss anything, remember to subscribe and hit the bell. Here's how we know the Earth rotates. The Sun, the Moon, every star in the sky, all celestial objects appear to orbit the Earth in 24 hours, in addition to their motions relative to each other, that is. Isn't that a pretty amazing coincidence? I'd say it's amazing enough to warrant an explanation. Here's one. They don't. It's the Earth that rotates once around its axis every 24 hours. What's interesting about this hypothesis is that it makes predictions that are not made by the alternative. That the Earth is completely stationary and the universe revolves around it. Specifically, it means that the Earth acts as a non-inertial rotating frame of reference. And I just lost about half of you. Well. That's okay, I'll explain. In physics, we use coordinate systems to describe where and when events take place. A coordinate system has clearly defined axes and a clearly defined origin where the axes intersect. If I describe the same situation using a different coordinate system, events will no longer have the same coordinates. I'm describing the situation from a different frame of reference. It's not that one is more correct than the other. They are simply different ways of describing the same thing. It's not strange at all. Just consider how you and another person can both agree on where a wall is. It's one meter left of you and three meters right of him. Both of you are equally correct and you are in no way contradicting each other. You are describing the same thing from different points of view. If the coordinate system isn't accelerating, we call it an inertial frame of reference. Inertial frames are nice because they make physics very simple and straightforward. For example, if an object which is initially at rest starts to move in an inertial frame, I know it's because a force acted on the object. This is why Newton's laws of motion apply in such frames. In fact, that's how inertial frames are defined in Newtonian physics. An inertial frame is a frame where the law of inertia applies. That is, an object will not accelerate unless acted upon by a force. But in a non-inertial frame, that's not the case. Let's say I define a frame that moves along with me. I go aboard a train, and there's a stationary pendulum hanging from the ceiling. When the train accelerates forward, the pendulum will swing toward the back of the train. In my frame, it appears that the pendulum started to swing even though no force acted on it. This is what makes it possible for me to know that the train has accelerated, and my reference frame is now non-inertial. In order to make Newton's laws work on board the train, I have to modify them. The net acceleration of the pendulum is supposed to be the total force on the pendulum divided by its mass, but the total force is zero. So instead we have to attack it from the other direction. Because it clearly is accelerating, we multiply the acceleration by its mass and find that the total force is not zero, even though no force is at work. We say that a pseudo-force, a force of inertia, is at work. Such forces are also called fictitious forces because they're not real forces. They only appear to function as forces because of how we choose to describe the situation. From a non-inertial frame of reference. This raises an obvious question. Why would we ever describe physics from a non-inertial frame of reference if it means that we have to invent fake forces just to make the math come out? I mean, doesn't this prove that our description is objectively wrong. Well, ultimately what matters is that I correctly model the behavior of the pendulum so that I can make accurate predictions about it. If I'm describing a situation that takes place aboard a moving train, treating the train as stationary and adding fictitious forces will actually simplify the description and make it easier to make such predictions. I mean, why take the motion of the train into account when it affects both me, the passenger, and the pendulum equally. It just complicates the math for no good reason. Now, what the hell does this have to do with the rotation of the Earth? Simple. If the Earth is rotating, a point on its surface is not only in motion all the time, it also changes direction all the time, which means it's accelerating. Thus, if I'm standing on a rotating Earth describing physics with an origin fixed to a point on Earth, that reference frame will be non-inertial, and I can look for the effects of two pseudo-forces that appear in rotating frames. The centrifugal force and the Coriolis force. But wait, before we do that, let's address the Flurf claim that 
we should feel a thousand mile per hour winds hitting us if the Earth were rotating one revolution every 24 hours, at least at the equator. This claim obviously makes the assumption that the atmosphere isn't rotating along with the Earth. And since we can't feel those winds, we must conclude that if the Earth is rotating, then the atmosphere is rotating with it. Done! Of course, in reality, the atmosphere formed along with the rest of the planet from a rotating cloud of material that collapsed due to gravity. Angular momentum is a conserved quantity, so why would it not rotate along with the rest of the planet? Now let's have a look at those pseudo forces. Let's start with the centrifugal force. You know this one. That's the one that causes your arms to be pushed out when you're spinning. What's actually happening, with quotation marks around actually, since this explanation is no more correct than the alternative that we're trying to get to, is that your arms are trying to move in straight lines due to their inertia. But as you rotate, you force them to change direction with an inward force, a centripetal force. You experience this as your arms being pulled away from you by an outward pseudo force, a centrifugal force equal in magnitude to the centripetal force that an inertial observer would calculate. The magnitude of the centrifugal force increases not just with angular velocity, the square of it to be precise, but also with the radius of rotation. This means the centrifugal force due to the Earth's rotation must get stronger the farther from its rotational axis you get, and that means it's strongest at the equator. For the record, the formula is FCF equals m omega squared r, where omega is the angular velocity in radians per second, m is the mass, and r is the radius in meters. Now, I know Fleurs don't believe in gravity, but they must acknowledge that an object falling freely on Earth, near its surface that is, will accelerate down at 1g, that is 9.8 meters per second squared. That's simply an empirical fact. I, I know Fleurs tend to ignore empirical facts when they don't like them, but I'm pretty sure they agree with this one. It's also an empirical fact this is only true in two significant figures. The real value varies between about 9.78 at the equator and 9.83 at the poles at sea level. Since r, the distance to the axis, is zero at the poles, the centrifugal force is zero there. But at the equator, the distance is the Earth's equatorial radius, and the force is directed outward, that is, directly opposite the pole of gravity. So one revolution every 24 hours in radians per second, square that, multiply by the radius in meters, bang, we get an outward acceleration of 0.04 meters per second squared. That's about what we'd expect. The last hundredth is due to the Earth not being perfectly spherical. Looks like we found our centrifugal force. Score one for the Earth spinning. But of course we can't settle there. Let's look for the Coriolis force as well. When a body moves inward on a rotating disk, its inertia causes it to keep its tangential velocity. But points farther in have lower tangential velocity, so this results in an increased angular velocity, causing the body to veer off in the direction of rotation. On Earth, which supposedly rotates eastwards, that is, counterclockwise as seen from above the North Pole, this means that objects moving away from the equator, that is, toward the rotational axis, will turn east. Similarly, objects moving toward the equator will turn west. Is this what we observe? Well, before we answer that, let's go over some misconceptions about what exactly we should expect. Flurfs have argued that if the Earth were rotating, it would be impossible to play tennis. This shows that they don't understand how slow one revolution in 24 hours, or 0.004 degrees per second, is. Yes, the Coriolis force affects a tennis ball, but to simplify the math to the point where high school physics will suffice, we can calculate the upper limit of the expected deviation. In reality, the effect depends on the location, specifically the latitude, and the orientation of the court. But the worst case scenario just happens to be the easiest one to calculate. The court has one end on either the north or south pole, and the ball's entire velocity vector points both north or south, depending, and also radially in or out. This makes the equation high school level simple. The Coriolis acceleration is 2 omega v, where v is the velocity of the ball. A tennis ball served at, say, 60 meters per second will take 0.33 seconds to travel 20 meters. This gives a Coriolis acceleration of 2 omega v equals 8.73 millimeters per second squared, 
which over 0.33 seconds results in a deviation of half a millimeter. So clearly the Coriolis effect is not a problem for tennis. The effect is completely negligible even given the worst case scenario. It's a little worse for snipers. Worst case scenario, a sniper fires at a target standing at the North Pole from, say, a kilometer away, with a bullet that travels at, say, 800 meters per second, about twice the speed of sound. It takes 1.25 seconds for the bullet to reach the target, and it will deviate by 9 centimeters. That's something you'd have to compensate for if you want to be sure you get a kill shot. But still, the effect is so small that someone unaware of the effect would probably shrug it off as the sight being misaligned. Which, incidentally, is how one would compensate for the effect. Align the sight accordingly. Flurfs seem to think that the bullet should deviate by hundreds of meters or something like that. And that's not what anyone who has studied this stuff expects. Now, if we want to look for the Coriolis effect on Earth, because the force is so weak, we need to look at systems that are affected by it for much greater time periods. Winds and ocean currents are great examples. And they behave exactly as one would expect. Winds blowing toward the equator veer off to the west, and winds blowing away from it veer off to the east, causing the air stuck in between to begin to rotate clockwise on the southern hemisphere and counterclockwise on the northern hemisphere. This is clearly visible in hurricanes. The Coriolis effect also sets the direction of the jet streams. Simply put, when hot air blows north from the equator, it also expands due to its temperature, losing density and thus rising. Its motion away from the equator means that it will move toward the Earth's axis, resulting in an eastward Coriolis force. A similar effect occurs farther north and south. The result is that at high altitude, you will find bands of strong winds blowing east with the Earth's rotation. This affects flight times. You'll notice that it takes an hour longer to travel from New York to LA than from LA to New York. Flurfs will claim that the Coriolis effect should result in the plane going from New York to LA should find LA being shot towards it, ignoring the plane's inertia and the fact that the atmosphere follows the Earth as it rotates. But of course, this simply isn't what anyone who understands the Coriolis effect expects. The Coriolis effect also affects a Foucault pendulum. A Foucault pendulum is a pendulum that's free to rotate, so that it might swing north-south at one point in time and east-west at a different time. If such a pendulum is affected by a force, it will of course change orientation. Invariably, we find that even when we eliminate things like wind by placing the pendulum indoors, if we let it swing for a long time, it will reorient itself by about 15 degrees per hour, or if you prefer, 0.04 degrees per second, or 360 degrees in 24 hours. Finally, of course, I have to mention the Flurve's supposed knockdown blow to the rotating Earth, the laser gyro. Yep, they went and bought themselves a laser gyro, which, if the Earth rotates by 15 degrees per hour, should register a drift of 15 degrees per hour. And the results are... But what we found is, is when we turned on that gyroscope, we found that we were picking up a drift. A 15 degree per hour drift. Interesting. Yes, interesting indeed. Yet another way we can see that the Earth is not just a ball, but a spinning ball. And this remains true no matter how much reality deniers whine about it. See ya.